there's Marcus. Uh, so my my history, I've been working on software projects for about 25 years. Uh, initially, like multimedia CD-ROMs and websites, and then a couple of friends of mine started a company called Sulake, where I joined to make Hubbo Hotel for about 10 years. Uh, was also the lead designer for Virtual Magic Kingdom for Disney uh, in that company. Then started a, a my own startup in, in London called Nikki Lab, where I made 3D printed toys and games. And um, after that, moved back to Helsinki to work in Next Games, where I've been working as an executive producer and, and a game designer. Whoop. My name is Markus Montola. I've been working on location-based games for 15 years. In 2009, we wrote a book and published a book called Pervasive Games Theory and Design, because we already knew how to design this kind of stuff. Then iPhone happened, and the playbook was rewritten. I was working on the first mobile location-based MMO Shadow Cities, and after that, I've been working on different mobile gaming startups in Helsinki for, uh, since then. Well, so, uh, so today's topics. Um, so we're basically going to talk about how we made original social gameplay for for the game. Um, and to get you started, we're going to talk about first basically explain what the game is. Um, so, how many of you have actually played it? Okay, quite a few. Awesome. Um, but first, first to you, give, to give some context. Uh, then we're going to be talking about the prototyping and pre-production research and, and things that we did to really figure out what the game was that we wanted to build. And then some about some of the, the designs that we actually landed on. So Walking Dead, our world, it's a location-based game. It's a single, single shard MMO uh, world scale where every single one of the players is in the same reality, uh, seeing the same missions. You can persist things on the map so you can actually put that stuff down. Other people will see it. Um, and, and you basically play the game by going to these missions that you see around you, kill the walkers, get some collectibles, and, and become more powerful to go into even harder missions. And this being based on the, the TV series, it features a lot of the characters from the TV series uh, as collectibles. So you can actually find and play with the, the actual show cast and, and get them to be more powerful and help you in the missions, as well as collecting weapons um, that you can use yourself. And when you go to missions, it kind of looks like this. So here I'm with Carl uh, shooting some zombies. Uh, you can use AR if your phone's compatible. So they actually like do real world human scale AR, AR things, which is really cool. Um, but last but not least, we do a guild system where each one of the players is pushed into a guild very early on during the game where you can chat. But they also has these um, task boards where you start to create this task, like complete this task together collaboratively with the rest of the guild and unlock some of the best rewards and then get progressively harder challenges as a group to complete. And and th this actually like turned out to be some, a lot more successful than, than we uh, thought it would or for me as a game designer, like basically like I've been reading some of the feedback we've been getting on this particular feature uh, and, and people are telling us crazy stuff like somebody is, is biking 30 kilometers every freaking day to complete more the missions to actually be able to help the guild advance in the, in the tasks. And, and, and a lot of people actually telling that they never quite felt this deeply about collaborative social gameplay in any of the games that they played before, uh, which I think is, is a like, really cool like, achievement for me as a game designer uh, to actually be able to pull it off if, in a like, small uh, mobile game. So how did we end up on this and creating a, a Walking Dead game in the first place? So the previous game we made uh, was called The Walking Dead No Man's Land, which is a tactical kind of like turn-based shooter. Uh, looks a bit like maybe XCOM, but super simplified for mobile. And, and where we featured similar elements where you were collecting the, the, the show cast. Uh, you made teams of three, uh, went into missions um, and, and like all different types, like solved little puzzles with these guys. And we're really happy about how this game, game game turned out. And AMC seemed to really enjoy us as well and liked the game. And, and it, simultaneously, The Walking Dead as TV series uh, is still doing incredibly well. So back in when we were starting the project, we were looking at the, the show and figured that like it, the, the brand has some true, true longevity. And AMC was quite happy with us, so we figured it's kind of like no-brainer to make another game with, with those guys. 
And at Next, when we start working on new projects, one of the things we really want to do is figure out gameplay mechanics in the games that make sense from the brand perspective. So we primarily do games based on IPs, and we now that we were creating a new game for The Walking Dead, we wanted to figure out like what would be a logical combination for that brand. And many of the viewers of the show actually like were telling us that they have this core fantasy of like really thinking what they would do if the, the zombie infestation actually happened. So we figured that like let's maybe try to prototype location-based gaming and see if that works because it's a really good brand fit actually like being able to really put you in the situation where like now you're alone you need to get better weapons better teams to to be able to survive um the zombies now this being the like beginning of the project uh we kind of figured okay like let's actually look at location-based gaming what's been done in the genre before to understand it better but also come up with a a like really, really live in the in the present and plan for the like the launch where you need to come up with a feature set that's actually doable in high quality um during the production but which has to be also really competitive when the game goes out so i think one of the big trouble problems is is when you have a production schedule of a couple of years you need to figure out a set of features and and gameplay that's going to be uh competitive and compelling to the players when you actually ship the game when the market's already changed to something different so what can we learn from the past? Um, Shadow Cities is like we will actually look into multiple games, uh, including Shadow Cities were one of the really early ones uh, that Marcos had made back in the day. And and where the gameplay basically was that you could build resource production, build but buildings on the map, um, become more powerful, uh, build teleports that allowed people to cooperate and travel the world. Super interesting, but also featured really brutal PvP where when you logged in, you could see the your surroundings, but all the other players immediately so as well. And if they weren't powerful, you just got ganked immediately. Uh, and that was kind of really cool if you were the more, most powerful kid on the block, uh, but many weren't. So, so the the location where you logged in and like what time of the day it really made like mattered because you started to learn these patterns of like where the other powerful players were. That like the areas to actually avoid um, due to some of the other players being there. Um, Pokemon Go had just come out, uh, so it was in the early stages of like a lot of people trying to, to play the game, um, and and this used fundamentally different design or, from what Shadow Cities had done in the back in the day. For in Pokemon, one of the things compared to Shadow Cities is like Shadow Cities give you perfect information as a player immediately. So like everything on the map was immediately interactable; you could see it. In Pokemon, they actually hide the vast majority of the content and they want to incentivize you to move to be able to play the game. So you find the things on the on the world and you could really not play without moving at all. Um, some of the content was obviously visible. So if you wanted to get more more Pokeballs, you'd need to go to the Pocket Stops that you did see uh, somewhere around in the in your neighborhood. And and in order to access a gym, you were, it's were very likely that you again needed to move because they were so sparsely um, placed in the world that it was quite unlikely there was anything next to you. And with Pokemon, one of the other things I got asked a lot in the early stages of the project, like how do we replicate this level of success? Or I think I think the primary reason why Pokemon is so successful is was again simply the fact that the activities that players do in the game is a excellent, like real band, brand fit to what people that people were expecting to make in the game. So if you saw, see the animated series ever, you kind of expect it, yeah, I'm going to walk around the world and throw balls at the Pokemon and collect them. And this is exactly what you do in the game. So the, the mental model that people had in their heads before they started playing perfectly matched the, the gameplay that they actually got uh, when they started playing the game. So the hard thing when you start making a location-based game is that there are no really that many location-based games, and especially there are not that many successful location-based games. So when we started, we knew that we would be again into a very exciting and challenging endeavor where we would need to figure out a lot of basic stuff from the get-go. The thing is that usually when you see people playing mobile games, the play pattern is something like this. You're somewhere, and then you play there for two seconds, and then you go somewhere else. Most mobile games are not really mobile. Location-based games are actually mobile. So we had to face all these kind of different play patterns that players might have. We had to figure out from the design angle, again, based on Shadow Cities, based on Pokemon Go, based on other games, like how would players maybe 
possibly use this game. This would be me. Most of the time, I'm a commuter player. So if I'm at work, if I'm at home, if I'm at games conference, if I'm in the bus, that's when I play. This is one of our key use cases. But we have to also figure, like, how is this game going to work for people who walk their dogs for one hour every day? And how are we going to keep it balanced for them? Some people like to jog a lot. They like to play real world games while they're jogging. We don't necessarily approve, but this is something they will anyway do, so we have to figure out how to deal with it. Something we learned once we actually had launched the game, we had a lot of tram riders. Trams move a little bit slower than buses, so they are perfect for playing uh, The Walking Dead, our world. Uh, you're sitting in the tram, you're grinding a mission, and the reason why you're sitting in the tram is that you're, you're trying to grind as efficiently as you can. We had half of our team sitting in the tram one week when we were in the soft launch trying to optimize on a mission. The key point you have to decide is, do you want the players to move in order to play or do you want them to play while they're already on the move? This is how Helsinki looks like. Next Games is based on Helsinki, and you can see the little dots on the map. They are the Google POIs where we spawn all our content. And when you're looking at this kind of a map, and when you're working in this kind of a city, you get all these exciting ideas about how this kind of a game could work. Maybe you go to a gas station to get some gas, and then you go to, uh, I don't know, to the riverfront to get some fish, and then you craft something. And, and that's, of course, a very good way of doing a game if you make a full collector game, like, for instance, Pokemon. But we knew that the, the brand of The Walking Dead is not about assembling collections, it's about something else, it's about survival and fighting and that kind of stuff. So we couldn't really do that. And, and the reality is that much of the map looks like this. This is Kansas in, in our world. You can again see the POIs on the, on the few roads that you have there. We couldn't really afford to have the fantasy of going to the gas station to get some gas, because f let's face it, we are in the mobile free-to-play market, and mobile free-to-play market is about, may, uh, about allowing players to generate value through going through core loop iterating over the core loop again and again. And if you're in this business, you have to be able to get the player into the core loop and out of the core loop and again into the core loop multiple times during their first session, no matter where they start. And since we were not doing a full collector, we had to make sure that our game was always playable everywhere and it would be nice and exciting experience no matter where you were. Of course, you can add that kind of frills later, but fundamentally, we had to be a core loop game. So we went back to the basic. Let's forget about the location for a moment and let's focus on how to make a really great mobile game. Like many other designers, we got highly inspired by the self-determination theory of motivation. If you provide players with competence, if you provide players with autonomy, and if you provide players with relatedness, then they will be highly motivated to play your game. This is a, one very good recipe for a very good game. Especially we identified the relatedness as a key USP that we could reach in the game. Other location-based games are also social, but we wanted to focus on guild play, we wanted to focus on the in-client social, because that is very much what the, se the series is also about. It's about pulling together, not apart, as Rick Grimes would say. So, Based on this groundwork, we started shaping up these core design pillars. Play everywhere. Wherever you log in for the first time, wherever you log in for the first day, first time on every day, you will, you will get a full and interesting complete session in there. It's always worth opening the game in the new location. There needs to be enough discovery that I want to see what's around me. We wanted to support couch play. We wanted to make a little bit more traditional game, so we wanted to make sure that people who would be mostly playing at home and at work would have a nice experience nevertheless. In our philosophy, getting a better location, moving around, is, it gives you a nice opportunity. It gives you better optimal situations, but it's never mandatory. We wanted to focus on the strong collaborative social mechanics, and finally, we wanted to be true to the Walking Dead TV series. So now we have some core pillars, and we should start to get 
thinking about like, how do we approach this? How do we validate these ideas? And how do we prototype them? And, and Sulka is going to tell you a lot more about that. All right, so we kind of figured out that there's five big questions uh, that we needed to answer before we knew exactly what we wanted to build were uh, with the core loop, uh, the, the, what were the constraints of how you actually can create missions that are meaningful um, on the map that people will be interacting with. And does the locational context bring something to the gameplay? Like what are the things that you can do? And are there some like must, like must not do's that we, we needed to take into account? Uh, we figured that like this is a map and like ge with geography there might be really interesting opportunities to create area-based gameplay and and with being able to place things on the map would be we knew that from Shadow Cities that this is a good opportunity but we needed to figure out like what is the gameplay that we would be doing it within the context of this game. For the social gameplay we wanted to try two different ways of adding social into the game where one would be on location social um, so that you'd actually need to be interacting with the other players or the play content that people have been placed on the map and and but also could we do a meta game on the social level that would be played through the on location missions but you still progress things on on the meta level um, Dan Cook has this really fantastic iteration, like illustration for I actually iterate on the games. So the way we think about this is early on in the creative process, you're going through these cycles where you want to add value and now try new things, but you need to be able to identify what's valuable and call away all the, all the things you are trying that don't actually ultimately add value to the, the players of your game. For, for the prototyping, the, the, the core cycle that we looked into that we wanted to do with each one of the prototypes is gather ideas and research, designs the, the gameplay mechanics that we wanted to implement into the, the, the test, uh, then build and, build and really do the testing and evaluate the results to see if this was something that we wanted to put into the game itself. And we, I think we ended up doing something um, like dozens and dozens of iterations ultimately on different features. Uh, started basically just using paper. Uh, paper is really fast. Uh, I recommend actually using like wooden tokens, whatever it takes uh, to figure out kind of like the initial ideas because this is really cheap. Um, but we pretty quickly got into the actual questions. Um, first being the, like with the core loop, is there something like constraints that the on location gameplay puts into how you do uh, gameplay in the game? Uh, so the first prototype basically looks really simple. Uh, we took assets from the previous Walking Dead game that we had done. So the walkers actually looked really weird because the, the perspective was different. Uh, you could just tap on them to kill them, like like mega simple first person mechanics. Uh, we figured that this might be a good fit. Um, put some missions on the map where you just could, like collect more weapons and get some bullets. And and we already got like from this really simple setup, I got super interesting findings. Where uh, firstly the first person shooter like looked promising, so we decided okay let's keep on iterating on this. Uh, but what really fascinated me was that there we again proved that there's no magic circle to location based game. So when I was playing the missions and like while I was brewing coffee for myself, waiting the kids to break off from the bed to, for me to take them to school, the gameplay experience was fundamentally different from when I was playing the same missions, walking toward lunch with my friends, where if anything like on the road took longer than something like 10 to 15 seconds, everybody else needed to actually stop and wait for me. And that was socially really awkward. So we kind of figured that like anything that we put onto the map itself, the interaction speed needs to be really, really fast. You need to be able to complete those missions and interactions like in seconds. Um, so the verdict kind of were like, okay, like this looks promising, but and uh, we can continue on this. Uh, but let's aim to keep things simple. Uh, with the missions, we did actually a couple different iterations. Again, we thought that maybe we can add depth to the individual missions if the even the, if the gameplay here is really uh, simple. Uh, by like allowing people to see perfect information about what's inside the mission versus imperfect information and make different type of decisions over like what's the gear that you're going to be taking into the mission like do you need to come up with a plan and and turns out actually the the, the mission version where you got the perfect information made people optimize their gear so much to the point where they actually kind of like this analysis paralysis of, of like overthinking what they need to do which turned out to be a really bad idea so we kind of figured that like okay, less thinking is actually better. Like, let's make sure that the interaction, again, is really fast and people don't need to think about things when they go into the missions. 
the other, like one of the actually really big ones is the, the players immediately started asking for a shared reality. So the first um, prototypes just randomly put stuff onto the map and you couldn't actually play with your friends because when you went walking with your buddies onto the, the world, uh, both of you saw random points on the map. So if you, I, saw, I saw something really desirable and like told, okay, let's go to that direction to pick up that mission because I really want to play it. Uh, my friend would say actually that like, no, like I'm seeing the same like cool mission the other direction and that was really awkward. So we need to realize that we actually have to create the system to make sure that all the players share the same content, shared reality uh, on the map itself. And which brought us to uh, starting to iterate on a like deterministic procedural content generator that produces the same results across the board for each one of the players. Um, and we're to taking the Google POI data uh, to with, with prominence information, that's really important, um, that we're using to, to spawn the map uh, to the players in a way that actually where the players see the exact same things. Um, took many, many iterations uh, to actually get this right and produce the desired gameplay patterns. Um, the way we're using the prominence is Google actually tells us what are the most important points in the world. And we can place some of the more important content that players are most likely to want to play in points that they're the most likely to visit during their commute during the day. Continuing on the next question. So with the core loop, we wanted to know about the area place gameplay mechanics. Um, so I figured that traveling salesman is a really nice NP hard problem that you can probably gamify in this context. And, and so we added this like with the missions, we figured out, okay, like the heroes, you can take them, they've had movement points so you go through multiple missions to come up with these chains that became progressively harder, but you got better loot. Um, and, and like this was a disaster. So players immediately lost immersion when they saw the 2D map versus actually the, like the map, the project, projected view. Um, and mixing on location play and the 2D map turned out to be incredibly confusing. So vast majority of people kind of like not only lost immersion, they couldn't quite figure where they were, where the heroes were, and like they just like lost the, the like they just couldn't cope with them of the information they were seeing. Uh, so we figured, okay, like this is going to be way too complicated for the core loop and, and we just decided to kill this. The other prototype we did with this is we split the world into a Voronoi graph, a uh, very fancy way of like actually like taking any area and split it, splitting into places or like smaller areas. Uh, you could capture the areas by playing a couple of missions and you got better loot if you um, progressively like played more in the same areas. And again, like completely disastrous results were way too complicated to be the core loop activity. And, and also secondly, like this felt psychologically wrong where we have this mental model of the world where we kind of think where the natural boundaries of areas lie. And, and the, the people are like really objected to us splitting the world into areas that didn't really correlate with anything that they had used to actually see in the world. Where we chose to kill this partially because this was kind of an unsolvable problem where if your players have a certain way of thinking about the world, uh, it's very unlikely that you can actually solve something like that in, in, in the games project. So I'm sure a mapping company might be able to do something with areas and like natural boundaries that, that conflicts with how people see the world. Uh, but like, we, like in the scope of the project, like we just could not have been able to solve this. Um, with the player generated content of the map, uh, the first prototype we did here is allow just very simply put resource generators on the map, uh, get resources, do appointments, uh, super, super simple. Um, and, and building stuff on the map felt really good. Uh, being able to see stuff like next to my home uh, was very powerful, but not being able to access the buildings where I weren't there felt really, really bad, like super bad. Um, so the, the kind of like the, the overall player sentiment was that the, the op needing to figure out where to play stuff in the world especially when you were potentially like you like should it be next to your home or next to your office and maybe you were commuting like through a daycare to drop off your kid and the figuring out what the optimal pattern for like placing the buildings would be it, like took some of the bad aspects of people needing to think about their daily routines in the context of the game in a way that made the decision process way too complicated uh, so the verdict kind of was that like wanted to retry the building, but some in some completely different form that didn't have the boundary, like the limitations of how you access this. So for the social gameplay, we actually decided to take the idea of the buildings and build a collaborative gameplay on location mechanic out of it. Or the, the concept was the safe havens. Um, so I did 
mission types were like admin missions where you can rescue survivors from the walkers and, and build buildings like safe havens for these people uh, to take into uh, to get loot. And, and they actually like this, the, firstly, the rescuing uh, felt really good, uh, very much aligned with the brand. So you, you can be the hero, uh, rescue people from the walkers. Uh, but also the fact that you can now see, get the C buildings from other players really like made the world feel alive. And, and the fact that we turned it into a collaborative play where you were leveling buildings together and it didn't really matter where you dropped the, the, the survivors into, uh, suddenly turned the entire feature around and made it feel really good. Um, so we actually figured that we need to turn this into, a, it continued iterating and turn it into a real feature. We also thought that we would do cooperative missions on the map where like players would be able to drop stuff on the map and play things together. Uh, so we made a simple prototype on a like this lure thing where like you could jump in and play missions. Um, and this turned out to be pretty disastrous as well where the the density of players at any given point in the world is actually something that's incredibly difficult to predict. And, and these missions that we built were fantastically fun when you had five of your friends participating in when you play in them. But immediately when you got more, we actually turned this into accidental rival good where the players started to feel that the other people, like too many people playing the missions was, took the nice easy missions away from them. And, and it became a like kind of race on who gets to complete the, the missions first. Uh, so that you can play and and we kind of like understood that okay like the if we want to do anything that you do co cooperatively like with the other players um we needed to would have needed to go to the drawing table and like figure some completely new way of approaching this problem so we decided to kill this for now we might do something with this later but uh, not now so social um so lastly the the collaborative meta game can play uh with the location based uh, so the we got this idea that let's add show locations um from the, the the show into the game where like say terminus and and so you'd get some couch play missions if you unlock these uh by completing missions on the on the map uh say kill 100 walkers in one of the missions that the place opens so you can play some missions like no matter where you are and, and do this collaboratively with your guild. And the result here was actually like we, this was unexpectedly, unexpectedly fun. So suddenly the, the progress bars that you got at the end of each one of the missions turned to be the most fun thing in the entire game. Much more fun than like any of the collecting mechanics, uh, like any of the other like finding new things. So we kind of felt that like this has to be something that we expand very significantly in the like and make something much, much better out of it. And, and at this point, we kind of felt that we had our five answers um, for the own location gameplay. We were happy with the first person shooter and figured that we need to keep this incredibly simple for the core loop on the map to actually be something that people want to engage with. The area-based gameplay was deemed to be not the fit for the product and the uh, player-generated content uh, was turned into a social feature rather than something that, that people would be doing as part of the core loop by themselves. The on-location social gameplay was figured to, deemed to be something that we should work on eventually, but, during, but it was too complicated for us to figure given the schedule of the project. And, and the social meta game driven by location uh, was deemed to be so like beautifully like nice and people loved it that we decided that this has to become a really good feel, like large feature in the game. And, and Marcus is gonna now talk about a bit more of what we actually did. So, as Sulka described, we figured all these things that don't work, and that's when our pre-production ended and we shifted into the production, trying to figure out like, okay, we're gonna do a game now, and the game has to like stay together and be engaging and nice and fun and fulfill all the goals. So, let's see what we did. We did what we like to call a bite-sized FPS. So, every session is pretty simple. First, you log in and you have a look around. You maybe collect some stuff around you. You look around at the fights around you and you pick a fight. You shoot walkers for 15 seconds. In this video, uh, the player is rescuing a survivor from walkers. And when I say you shoot zombies for 15 seconds, I really mean like 15 seconds, and that often includes the loading times. We really wanted this to be short and snappy and bite-sized. You get some stuff, and then you use that stuff to upgrade. You log in, you have a look around, you collect stuff, you pick a fight, 
you shoot for 15 seconds, you upgrade. That's really simple. We wanted to make sure that you could do this everywhere. You wanted, we wanted to make sure that you would see nice things around you while you do this. We wanted to make sure that every time you did this, there would be stuff to play, stuff to collect. We didn't want to ever have any failure sessions there would, when it, there would be nothing to collect. And our, our, our collaboration with the Google Maps has guaranteed that we can actually do this. They give us really nice points of interest everywhere, except for some designated no-play areas like, like airstrips, where we don't want players running around. Upgrading is quite simple. We were doing so many novel things in this process that we wanted to make sure that at least something would be tried and true and we wouldn't need to figure it all out. So basically you collect weapons, you collect heroes, and you collect some other items from the series, and then you level, up, level them up just as if you were playing Clash Royale. We want the players to unite with other players. So in the end of the tutorial, you will be offered one guild to join. And the cho choice is basically join this guild or search more. In, in The Walking Dead No Man's Land, we have learned already at Next Games that this is the best way we can sort of encourage you to join a guild, give you one recommendation, zero decision-making anxiety, and join or don't. We actually intend to be even more aggressive about it in future. We're actually thinking about forcing players into guild. Consequently, 90% of our daily active users are in guilds, and we've learned that the the, the business value in retention, monetization in all respects, the, the gilded players are so much more valuable for us than the other players that, that we don't really lose anything if players don't, who don't want to join a guild uh, leave our game. Scavenging is also a big part of The Walking Dead, and we wanted it to be a big part of our core loop as well. So, Every time you log in, you can see some resource crates around you where you can collect things like energy, you can collect grenades and first aid kits. Some free-to-play games decided to make these kind of resources extremely scarce. They want you to have that one, I don't know, lollipop hammer that you will treasure looking for the impossible mission. We wanted to do this in a completely opposite fashion. In our game, you get collectibles, uh, consumables all the time. However, the caps are very low, so you need to also spend them or you, or you end up wasting them. This creates a loop where you're actually constantly spending consumables, con constantly getting consumables, and sometimes you actually do run out, and that's the monetization point. But if you want to just, like, if you just walk 100 meters, you will get some more. So even though it's a pinch, it's not that kind of pinch as we usually think of it in, in free-to-play games. So let's look at our core loop. You log in somewhere, you look around, you will scavenge the consumables. You will take the consumables and spend them in different kinds of fights. You will gain cards and coins and survivors. You take the survivors into safe houses to get even more cards. And then you use the cards and coins to upgrade your things. Rinse and repeat as many times as you like. So we were not entirely satisfied with this core loop at this point. It felt a little bit dull. The players kept requesting all kinds of discovery. They wanted to really go to that gas station and get some gas. And we were like, we're a little bit short of resources and we don't want to do that, much, that big an investment in that kind of gameplay. So we introduced rare and epic missions where you would get guaranteed rare and epic cards. And suddenly players were seeing a, a purple glow in the horizon and they would be walking there to see what's in there. They would be talking in the guild channels like there's a thing in the market street. If you're near market street, you should go there and get it. We were also introducing both dynamic and static difficulty missions. We wanted to make sure that there would be always nice content for you to play, so we had to resort to dynamic difficulty most of the time. However, if you design a game that only has dynamic di difficulty, you end up in a situation where progress doesn't feel like progress because the difficulty always increases. So many of the rare and epic missions we spawn are on the static difficulty, so they communicate to the player like, if you were a tougher guy, you could also be playing this mission. So the core loop is now a little bit more complicated. There's different varieties of missions, there are di different varieties of crates, and there are a lot, lot more options what you can do while you 
move around. Of course, these are very contextual opportunities, so if you happen to be in a nice location, then you will have nice opportunities, and if you're not in a nice location, then you have to figure out whether you conserve your energy and your grenades, or whether you will use them on the bad opportunities right here, right now. Sulka mentioned the safe havens. Nowadays, they're called safe houses. Players can build buildings in our world. Uh, after you built a building, you can leave survivors there. You get rewards, and you also improve your rating in the safe house leaderboard. If you leave enough rescuees there, then the safe house will be upgraded. If you don't upgrade your safe house in, in a while, then it will be destroyed by ra raiders. We also have different kinds of safe houses that give you different kinds of cards as rewards. So suddenly we are facing a surprisingly complex decision space. You have to figure out whether I want guns or heroes this time, whether it's important for me to upgrade this safe house, whether it's important for me to beat the other guys on the leaderboard to become the, the leader of the safe house and get improved rewards, or whether it's imp important for me to save a safe house from destruction. The leaderboards also have a really nice quality of showing that other people are also playing around you. And they, they create this kind of neighborhood friendly co-op competitions where someone is a leader in this house and some, uh, someone else is leader in that house. And if you try to be too greedy about too many safe houses, then you actually can't be a leader in any of them. This is kind of like, we wanted to make the location a social opportunity for you and this Kind of simple, kind of complex game uh, allows for that. Sulka mentioned that we are a single shard game. So we are, every, everything in the world is mostly similar to all the players. So when I can see something cool, I will tell you that it's on the market street and go there. Uh, however, we wanted to also introduce a feature to facilitate that, and that's why we created a feature called Flare. Flare is a consumable that I can deploy here, and if I deploy a flare here, all my friends in my guild can teleport here for free. Uh, this helps us a lot in, in creating kind of a social dynamic where it, it's, it's some, somewhat patronage. It, it, is, it is couch play because I can invite you here while you're, I don't know, ill at home or whatever. It allows virtual tourism. I have been sharing Moscow Center several times this week because I want to tell everyone that I'm here. And when we get to the deeper <clears throat> social tasks, uh, the flare allows for added coordination. So the core loop. Uh, let's add some exploration. So you have different kinds of safe houses. Now it's starting to become a little bit of a resource management game. You have this one survivor and you have five safe houses around you and then you're trying to figure what to do with this guy. And the way we built the thing is that it's mostly cooperative, so everyone is benefiting from this friendly competition, but the guys who are playing most actively and making smartest choices are benefiting even more. It's also not a very serious game. The benefits that you get from leaving your survivors into better safe houses are actually quite small, but they are nice. So we wanted to make sure that you can't make mistakes but if you're smart, you can be a little bit better in the game. Also, we wanted to give an alternative to the walking and discovering, which is the teleportation. So now you can ask your guildmates to flare you somewhere, or you can share something that you find and, and flare others to there. You can share the location opportunities to other players. It looks nicer now, the core loop, but not nice enough just yet. Remember this, Sulka showed this and said that nothing felt as good as seeing the bars progress after a battle, and this is very much true. Uh, this was a very good prototype for us, and based on this simple progress bar system, we wanted to develop something a little bit more sophisticated and, let's be honest, a little bit more complicated. So this is a guild board. It consists of about 25 missions that you complete. There are also three chests on the board, and if you complete a row and a column, then you can collect the chest in the intersection of that row and column. But the, the, the thing is this, everyone in your guild is collaboratively completing these quests, and all the rewards are social. There is no way for you as an individual uh, to benefit any more than everyone in your guild benefits. 
When you unlock the chest, everyone unlocks the chest. The only thing that you can gain in the guild board for yourself is that if you're a top contributor to a task, you get your face on the wall, like the, the four yellow portraits in the top row. This has turned out to be a surprisingly strong motivator for players. Some people want to, I, I want my face on the wall so that I can prove that I play a lot. I want my face on the wall so that I won't be, be kicked away from the guild. I want my face on the wall because I already have seven and I want more faces on the wall than Sulka has. This is how the tasks look like. Win 40 battles. This is an easy task. This is actually so easy task that when you start playing the game and you're in the guild, you start kind of accidentally completing the quests. And this is what hooks you into this somewhat complicated guild board system. Actually, there's a funny story about this screen on the right, si right hand side. A programmer was implementing this feature and they came to me and they complained like, I, I just played this mission and I completed seven tasks or, or incremented seven tasks. And I was like, yeah. So, so it's not a, like it's, isn't it a little bit weird to complete seven tasks at one go? And I was like, if you choose the optimal hero and the optimal gun and the optimal mission, and then you go there with optimal, I don't know, grenades or something, and you manage to progress seven missions at the same time, isn't that cool? So actually, we ended up designing the easier guild boards in a way where this is very likely and constantly happens. On the later guild boards, on the harder tasks, uh, you will get this kind of missions. Lone Wolf, one group member must win 80 level 20 battles with a reclaimer shotgun. So suddenly you need to parse together quite a bit of information and you need to start sharing tasks. Who's going to do the reclaimer task because someone else is doing something else? This 25 square board is, in a sense, it's a simple representation. In a, in a sense, it's complicated. But the interesting thing is that it has surprising depth when you're trying to track the progress of everyone in your guild and trying to figure out what they are actually doing and what is your best way of contributing to the common task. It's also a great collectible motivator because if no one has the reclaimer shotgun, no one's able to complete that quest. So this is a way we can, we can shuffle players' collections around and make sure that even the weakest weapons are used. We organized these guild boards into 20 different tiers. On every tier, you have three identical boards. So, the boards are identical except for the target counts of the missions. So on the first board of the first tier, you might need to complete 10 battles, then 20, and then 40. And we decided, designed this in this way in part because we want the first board to be a practice board. Usually the first board takes a good guild about one day. And that is the one day during which you learn to allocate your resources and coordinate your efforts so that when you, you're tackling the real challenge of the third board, you will be educated and understanding the task you have to do. You have one week to complete every tier. So this is a time pressure challenge. And this works really nicely for us in a weekly cycle. Every, day the, every Thursday when the boards open, we can see a peak in the player activity when everyone is enjoying the fact that they can progress seven missions at one time and when they are charging through the easy board. However, if you don't complete the, the tier in the, in the week, then you will be starting that tier over the next week. So it's also a challenge that, makes, that becomes harder and harder every week. And finally, we have eight weeks in every season, and we have a leaderboard where we track the best guilds in the world, and, and after the eight-week season, you will get a massive reward and start over. We spent a lot of time iterating these guild boards, trying to figure out how we can make them work. One important thing we did was that we specifically decide, decided that none of the tasks require you to be co-located. So basically, you can play with friends from anywhere in the world and, and succeed in the guild boards. It was far too complicated for, even, for us to even plan about the missions that would require everyone to go to, I don't know, Moscone West to do something that would have been Super complicated. One of the important features in the boards is that it's, it's 25 squares, so, so the, like the learning it is super hard. So one thing we did was that we decided what, that one of the chests is easy chest, another chest is a medium chest, and the third one is the hard chest. And every mission that leads to the easy chest is actually super easy. 
so that when you, you're semi-randomly doing things on the map, you actually see that these quests are starting to complete, and then you're actually figuring out that there's an opportunity of grabbing the easy chest if you just coordinate the efforts a little bit. And then, of course, when you have done that, you've done quite a bit of work towards the medium chest as well. So that will be half complete when you're done with the easy chest. And the same goes on with the hard chest. One thing we also did here is that some of the missions are, as, as the previous example, they are a lone wolf quest so that one player needs to focus their efforts on one task. This has been a really interesting, dramatic tool for us. Uh, one thing we can do, for instance, is that we, we take the best player away from some difficult mission so that the others need to shine because the best player is focusing on the lone wolf mission. The lone wolf missions also become competitions between players when both want their face on the wall and they, then they are effectively wasting their efforts in, in this glory hunt, which is really nice. We worked even further with trying to make sure that these guild boards would always be like, like so, so that the players would also have hope in completing the guild boards. So here you can see the difficulty curve of the guild boards. Basically, on the left side you can see the tier one, and on the right hand side you can see tier 20. And you can see the small numbers, but I, I can tell you that the, the highest, most difficult guild board has difficulty multiplier of about 300 compared to the difficulty multiplier of about one of the easiest board. So if on the first board you have to win 10 battles, on the last board you will have to win uh, 3,000 battles. So they get extremely difficult towards the end of the stack. It was hard for us because players were getting stuck on the boards, and then your, your social dynamics start to go awry because when you lose hope, then there's no, nothing fun in the game anymore. And then some, some people stop playing, and then it gets even harder to progress. So one of the th important things we did was that, as you can see here, the, the difficulty curve of the first board of every tier is actually quite lenient. So no matter where you are, you can always complete the first board. The second board, which is the medium board, is, is a little bit of a challenging, and then the real push is the third one. But then there's another aesthetic that is really nice here, besides the aesthetic of hope, which is that the first board is always a really nice reward for you. Like in Clash of Clans, the reward for upgrading your town hall level is not really the better town hall. The reward in Clash of Clans is that you get to upgrade all your stuff really fast, and so the game becomes very fun to play. And here the same thing happens with the first board being fun to play and super quick and super fast. We found this math of hope really important part of the dramatics of the guild board system. So let's look at the core loop. It was a little bit complicated already, but then there are different kinds of missions that you have to do. And you have to start optimizing not only between the rare missions and the, the, the safe house that you want to save, you have to also start to coordinate with your friends and you have to start to figure out which are the best ways for me to contribute in these guild quests. And it gets pretty complicated because there are now multiple social systems that are interacting in unpredictable ways. You have both the local social system of, of safe houses, and then you have the guild-based social system of the guild boards, and, and both of them are dynamic, both of them are unpredictable, both of them are gamed by not only you, but also your, your guild, and that makes the game quite deep, actually. Of course, every game gets stale over time, so we also added some token events, so sometimes you want to go somewhere even to get this week's special mission tokens. I, I think I heard of the term smart depth first time uh, about 10 years ago in a WUGA presentation, and their point was like, that you want to enrich your core loop while you want to keep your core loop just as it is. So you want to add smart depth while keeping it simple. And, and I think we succeed in our world in this task because this is still a really simple decision space. You can't do anything wrong, you can just fail. Uh, you, you can just uh, introduce waste in your process. There, there is no failure every time you log in you, shoot some, you pick a fight, you shoot something for 15 seconds, you progress in the game. But if you're really smart, you can progress a little bit more. And even for advanced players such as myself, sometimes I'm, I don't know, walking on the street and I don't want to think that much, while at other times I want to be super careful of my resource management. Like, I have one energy, what is the best way for me to use this one energy here right now? Of course, from design perspective, this is kind of 
difficult to handle because there are so many options. So we were thinking like, how can we simplify this? And then we figured out like, let's just assume that players are scavenging quite optimally at all times. Let's just do all our Excel math, assuming that they get really good grades at all times. And that helped us a lot. And then we figured out, let's just assume that they put their stuff in really good safe houses at all times. And if they don't put their stuff in the really good safe houses at all times, then they're introducing waste and that is their problem. And then we figured like, let's assume they win all the battles, so we don't need to think about the difficulty in terms of economy design. Of course, we think about difficulty a lot, but in terms of economy design, you always win. And since location is just an opportunity, even the teleport flare feature is just like, we just assume that you have really good opportunities at all times. So from economy design perspective, this is how our game looks like. Time equals progress. And it's modulated by skill and effort so the player can introduce some waste if they are not ideal. And of course, no one is ideal. But at the same time, it's still the social fantasy of The Walking Dead, surviving by pulling together and not apart. So, time to start getting into actual takeaways. So looking at the core pillars that we set early on in the project we wanted to achieve, we feel that we pretty much nailed all of these. You can play the game pretty much everywhere. It's always worth opening the game when you've moved. Uh, it, the very game is quite so, look, couch play friendly, uh, given given the location based aspect of it. Uh, the me social mechanics we we wanted to make something that was really strong. We actually did it, and and the game really does feel like The Walking Dead, where you absolutely have to coordinate your efforts with the other players in order to actually succeed. So even though the shape of the game that we ended up making was quite different from what we imagined at first, we're very happy with what we ended up with. A key takeaway is that when you do novel design, you have to do a lot of prototyping and valida validation. And the important thing in the prototyping and validation is that you have to accept that it takes time and it requires many failures. And of course, paper prototypes are the cheapest and quickest way to fail which is very good, but ultimately you will have to, especially with the social systems, you have to actually build good proper pro prototypes, and we spent a lot of time doing that. So having said that, yes, you need to be able to and, and prepared to kill all the darlings, even if they're really cool. Um, I personally, like the we, we as humans, uh, very easily fall with the, the uh, sunk cost fallacy, where we think that we put so much time and effort and love into a prototype and it must f succeed simply because we like it so much or we invested so much energy into it. But let's well, all as game designers and game developers try to fight that and make sure that if something doesn't actually fit your game, just kill the feature away and your game's going to be so much better for it. Even though there are no references for novel design, you can always have references and you should look outside the box for references if you don't have them. Our, our guild board system is basically a marriage of Disney Tsum Tsum's bingo boards combined with Everwing's guild quests and, and our shooting mechanics combine Operation Wolf with Whack-A-Mole. So the, the language of games is still very, very important when you don't have anything direct to look at. With the core loop, um, once you actually figured out something that really works, uh, continue iterating and adding more features, but really do try to keep it simple and, and have the same uh, way of people approaching how they play the game throughout the process. So you'll end up with a loop that is still easy to play, but has so much depth if the players actually really want to look for it. And finally, you need to iterate your own game until you're hooked to it. On the right hand side, you can see a guild board on tier, tier three, which I completed alone because all my guild mates were slacking that week because I wanted to progress and they didn't. So um, thank you, uh, hope you enjoyed and really good to see so many people here despite the, I, I guess, assume the party is starting at six o'clock. So uh, I'm Sulka. My name is Markus. And please remember to fill up the, the feedback forms if you like the presentation. Oh. I assume we might have time for like maybe one question. I'm just curious about how long um, did you guys spend just in pre-production? 
Uh, so the core prototyping, I think we spent maybe 10 months on it, uh, like actually like doing things that ultimately mostly got chucked away. So, um, and the team was at some point like, or I remember the programmers re asking like, do we really want to spend all this time doing things that we're going to throw away? So we did, but we did, um, and we did a huge refactoring pass of actually rewriting a lot of the code from the prototypes to be something that we could actually put into the final shipping product. Cool. Thank you. Cool. I guess that's it. Thank oh, you. There, oh, oh, okay. Hi. Uh, thanks again. Uh, never work on a location-based game, so maybe my question will be done, but did you see some uh, changes in players' behavior based on climate? or like warm countries or during the season? And did you make some adjustments with events or stuff like that or rules based on level design to accommodate that? We are internally debating on how much those effect, effects influence our game. Personally, I know that when my hands freeze, I stop playing. <laughs> so in order to accommodate players like me, we have done some increase in the couch play. Uh, lately to accommodate for the winter, but, but uh, we don't really know conclusively. Yeah, the, the other thing to keep in mind is the geography of the world is fundamentally different with, depending where you go. So uh, one of the features of Helsinki is that the, the, uh, the city blocks are huge. Uh, so the, the number of buildings they actually see at any given point is actually not that big because the, the buildings are so big. Uh, but if you open the game in India, like in typical Indian cities, the game has to load about 5,000 buildings because uh, they're all very small. Uh, so the, the way we built as humans have built uh, the, this equal, like the system we're in which we're, we're living uh, is so fundamentally different that if you want to design a game that actually works across the, the globe, it's not only the, the like how warm it is somewhere, but there's so many aspects that you actually need to look into and like you need to play and try teleport around the world, uh, look at how the game works uh, across the globe. And so it's, it's very complicated to actually isolate any one thing that would um, make a difference to, to the players when, where they, depending where they are. Thank you.